Wrong place at the wrong time. Something that applies to the luckless kid's birthday party clown who gets caught up in the middle of a bank robbery. Hey, it happens. As well as a cavalcade of unfortunately overlooked WWE stars. Some wrestlers past and present may have had the ability and desire to get to WWE, but they and their fans find out when they make it to the big dance that they are men and women out of time, as Bobby Davro once wisely said. Or maybe it was Bob Dylan. One of the Bobs, anyway. Had these bone benders been born 20 years earlier, or perhaps 10 years later, and shown up during another era, things might have gone very differently for them. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 overlooked WWE stars who belonged in a different era. Join us. Number 10, Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch. 15 years before Cowboy You Know What became cool, Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch showed up in WWE doing their best smoking guns impression. This was in 2005, or smack bang in the middle of the ruthless aggression era, where WWE's strategy with the tag team scene was to either team up two singles wrestlers who had nothing else going on, or bring up fresh teams with dodgy gimmicks. Cade and Murdoch, aka the Redneck Wrecking Crew, were a pair of solid workers who had a southern style and perhaps could have used a manager to do their talking for them. They were successful winning multiple tag team titles and being involved in their fair share of storylines and feuds, but their run only lasted a couple of years and truth be told, their act felt anachronistic from the off. At another time, perhaps in the late 70s or early 80s, they would have been a far bigger deal as they had the size and believability required in those days. Cade especially could have been a single star in WWE as he had that whole young Barry Windham thing going on. That said, Trevor Murdoch is killing it right now in the NWA. Number 9, Canyon. Who better than Canyon? Well, according to WWE decision makers during his time there, lots of people. Almost everybody, in fact. The innovator of offense came in during the invasion and looked set to receive something of a push alongside friend and tag partner DDP before they ran into a Kane and Undertaker shaped wall. Canyon then went down with an unfortunately timed injury, re-emerging over a year later by coming out of a giant box singing a Boy George song while dressed up as the Culture Club frontman. Draw your own conclusions as to the intent, folks. From there, Canyon's ample talents were wasted as he rotted on velocity and house shows before his inevitable release. With his progressive in-ring style and deceptive size, he was 6 feet 4 inches tall and close to a natural 270 pounds, Canyon would have fit right in during the, for example, New Generation era. You could see him having grand matches with the likes of Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart or others, and he could even portray a gimmick to make him stand out more a la Mortis in WCW. Though, now that I think about it… Number 8, Dan Seven. In an environment of over-the-top excess, lurid catchphrases and wacky stunts, Dan Seven stood apart as an ordinary looking bloke with a moustache. Completely out of place in the Attitude Era, former NWA champion Seven's WWE run has to be considered a major disappointment. Because while he may have looked like your friendly uncle, he was actually as legit as they come, possessing an enviable record in MMA that made him a UFC Hall of Famer. In late 90s WWE, his brand of grappling and submission based wrestling couldn't hope to compete with the outlandish characters or frenetic pace of the matches. Had Seven come about in the 70s or 80s before WWE properly became sports entertainment, pal, he would have likely been a shoe in for a WWE title run. Tell me you can't see the Beast throwing down with Bruno Sammartino or Bob Backlund in a smoky Madison Square Garden and I will tell you, well, you're simply not using your imagination quite enough. The same goes for Ken Shamrock, really, who was much different to Seven and a bigger WWE star, but could have been a seriously major deal during another time. Number 7, Paul London. Before WWE started signing every talent who had cut their teeth in Ring of Honor, ready for a big push in NXT, there were a few indie standouts who put pen to paper and then fought an uphill battle to get their opportunity. The sensational Paul London was one of those lucky, debatable, few, the Texas native catching the eye with his high fly risk-taking ways. Regrettably, a lot of his good stuff took place on the little-watched Velocity, but London did have a cruiserweight title run and a damn fine and long tag team title reign with Brian
Caroline Kendrick before things just sort of fizzled out. And that is a shame because it always felt like he was capable of doing so much more than what WWE were willing to let him do. Perhaps years after his release, when the indie style that he was one of the innovators of became hip, as the kids say, he would have had a better shot of doing something at a higher level, probably in NXT with contemporaries like Kevin Owens, Adrian Neville and Finn Balor. Number 6. Mr. Kennedy He could talk, he could work, he had a catchphrase and initially the full support of backstage power players. Yet it all went wrong for Mr. Kennedy, one of the great hopes of the ruthless aggression era whose WWE career went spectacularly wrong thanks to a potent mix of injuries, bad luck and even worse errors in judgments. In flashes reminiscent of a young Stone Cold Steve Austin, no, really, Kennedy would have been in his element during the Attitude Era, where his slightly disjointed, brawling style would have blended in nicely and he could have tested his promo game against some of the industry's heavy hitters. The Kennedy character needed a bit more of an edge to it, and it would have been interesting to see what he could have come up with during those anything goes days. He proved during his mid 2000s heyday that he could hang with major stars like The Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, and Batista, and I don't doubt he could do the same with The Rock, Triple H, and Co. had he come around years earlier. Number 5. S.A. Rios Any UK wrestling fan who grew up watching Sunday Night Heat on Channel 4 will have fond memories of this fella. Breathtakingly graceful luchador S.A. Rios had been with WWE since late 1997 when he was just 19 years old and working under a mask. He was a cog in the company's go nowhere light heavyweight division at that time, only to re-emerge a short while later with bright red hair and a beautiful woman named Lita on his arm, making him something of a star. But then then Lita upped and left for the Hardys, her star continuing to rise, while Essays fell and he booked a permanent residency on weekend shows like Heat, Jacked and Metal. Had SA come along a year or two or three or four later, when SmackDown had its own cruiserweight division and smaller wrestlers got more chances to shine against one another, then he might have had a longer and more fruitful WWE career. He certainly had the talent and a unique look, and despite being young, was pretty damn experienced too. SA would have matched up well with the great cruiserweight champions like Tajiri, Jamie Noble, Rey Mysterio, and Hornswoggle. Number 4. Sean O'Hare Was there anything that Sean O'Hare didn't have? Well, besides perhaps a friend to tell him not to get into ill-advised bar fights, that is. Tall, jacked, killer look, ridiculous athleticism, and a genuine tough guy aura, O'Hare was like a video game creation come to life, a freak of nature who could soar through the air with a flip or roundhouse kick your head off depending on his mood. A huge WWE what if, O'Hare's future looked promising when he came in as the intriguing devil's advocate before being put with the legendary Roddy Piper. But after Piper got suddenly fired, O'Hare floundered and eventually asked to be let go. After his release, O'Hare spoke in interviews about how WWE were constantly trying to water him down by getting him to work as a more traditional big man, which took away a lot of what had made him stand out in WCW. Could you imagine O'Hare turning up in the performance center when its doors opened. They would never take the NXT title off him. Number 3. Rene Dupree A textbook case of too much too soon, Rene Dupree was handed the world and the world tag team titles when he made his WWE debut at just 19 years old. A second generation wrestler whose father was also a promoter, the French phenom may have grown up in the business, but he lacked the maturity needed to fulfill his vast potential. Like many from the time, Dupree encountered difficulty backstage and fell into substance abuse issues which derailed what had looked to have been a very promising career indeed. Possessing a chiseled physique, knowing how to work and talk, and having the whole French thing going for him, even though he was actually French-Canadian, Dupree could have conceivably been a foreign menace type of heel in the 80s or even early 90s. You know, the type of Hogan or Savage or Warrior could have run through on the house shows. Rene knew how to get heat and was a great foil for a heroic babyface, as evidenced by his feud with John Cena after getting drafted to SmackDown in 2004. And besides, if Rene was a bust, Vince could always book Fifi against Matilda. Number 2. Casey James Casey James? Who's that? Did you just invent him, Adam? You can't just make wrestlers up to pad out a list, you wanker. Well, actually, I can do whatever the hell I want, thank you very much, but Casey James was a real WWE star, loosely speaking, who definitely existed. James was one half of the short-lived Teacher's Pets tag team alongside idol Damian Sandow Stevens in 2006. He also, as James Curtis, had a cup of coffee on the ECW 
BMW brand before getting his marching orders and all but disappearing from the business. And that is a shame, because the skinny on KC is that prior to getting to WWE TV, he was pretty damn great as an old school southern style era worker who would have thrived in the territory days. Since WWE eventually gobbled up most of the territories during their aggressive mid 80s international expansion, KC James could have hypothetically been one of those talents that came in to bolster Vince McMahon's ever growing roster. He wouldn't be working on top or anything, truth be told, but you would like to think he would be good for a 15 minute draw with Leaping Lanny Poffo in match number two. Well, I'd like to think that anyway. I have a weird brain. Number one, Rusev and Lana. One of those real how did WWE fail to make these guys the biggest thing in the entire world situations. The topsy-turvy tale of Rusev and Lana lays bare a lot of WWE's recent shortcomings when it comes to creating and maintaining stars. It started off positively enough, with the Bulgarian brute and ravishing Russian being booked strong and getting over to the point that they were placed in a WrestleMania showdown opposite John Cena. After that though, it felt like WWE never never really knew what to do with them long term as they turned from heel to babyface and back again, were put in groups or teams and placed in storylines that benefited absolutely nobody. The WWE were happy to release both into the wild while they should have been hitting their prime speaks volumes. Perhaps in another era they would have flourished, whether the cartoonish 1980s, obviously Rusev is going to lay down for the big leg, brother, or the attitude or ruthless aggression eras, where their act could have had a bit more grit and been allowed to develop organically rather than being scrapped for no good reason.